Thanks for uh, finishing. Um, so um, my name is Chris Snyder from Dartmouth College. This paper is co-authored with Michael Kramer from Harvard. Um, so it has the word disturbing in the title, which if you want a you know, a dry theory paper and you want people to perk up their interest, <laughs> you put the word disturbing in the title. So this is uh, Buddha being disturbed by, uh, out of his uh, meditation. So I'm, that's my role, and you're Buddha, and I'm disturbing you out of your meditation here. So this is a, a theory paper investigating some basic fundamental ideas, um, textbook ideas, really, um, on distortions in, in commercial unregulated markets without any externalities. Um, and I think you're going to see, um, this, this is going to be, uh, Gary Becker probably knew all these things. And if he didn't, any of the things he didn't know, he'll be able to intuit before I finish the end of the relevant slide. Um, so in any event, we're going to be talking about distortions here. Um, uh, distortions and commercial markets, again, no externalities, um, um, no government intervention. So it's just going to be distortions due to an inability to extract surplus that firms create. Um, so some questions are, how large can distortions be in this commercial market? Um, and what is the source of more distortion? Is it going to be at the intensive margin, um, the you know, Harberger Triangle from pricing, um, or at the extensive margin? Is that, can, can that be a source of greater distortion? Uh, in this case, distorted investment incentives, in particular, whether or not a firm actually enters that market. Uh, we're going to focus, we can make a lot of, we're going to be able to uh, go a, f a large distance looking at worst case scenarios. So how bad can the distortion be on a given market? Um, so for a given market, how bad can the distortion be? And then in a class of markets that look like a particular one, um, what's the worst case scenario in that class? The, um, so one, one question is, you know, how is it that this paper, this you know, theory paper, is going to be related to these other empirical papers? Um, so I thought a little bit about that. And I think it comes down to the fact that we use the term rho, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Um, but unfortunately, I use rho to mean something different. Um, rho, for me, is going to be the, um, this monopoly surplus extraction ratio. It's going to be the ratio of uh, what the monopolist earns to the total potential of first best surplus in the market. That's going to be the, the key issue. We just say, when is that big? When is, when is this market good for a monopolist? Um, that's going to be the key issue. Um, so, the, so that's kind of an interesting question in and of itself. But you know, what, what do you make of that? And the first half of the talk is going to be talking about um, you know, what, what implications flow from that. We're going to have a theorem that says that's related to the, uh, an upper, tight upper bound on the maximum deadweight loss in the market. So you could say, OK, fine. but you know, who cares about deadweight loss? Typically, deadweight loss is used as an index where you can say, well, I want to compare two policies. Which one has a smaller deadweight loss? So that's a useful measure here. We're just kind of looking at one market. We're not really comparing deadweight loss measures. So we'll have to do some work to say, well, here are some policy relevance of that um, measure. But once we've done that, that's the first half of the talk. Then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, in a sense, the geometry of demand curves and, you know, how if you have a particular market you like, what, what things to look for, a suite of results characterizing this row star. Maybe it's not going to be necessarily all, those all that interesting, but it's a, maybe a reference section of the paper. Um, and then um, if, if you don't ask any questions and you're good, we'll get to um, the empirical part of the paper. Well, well anyway, some calibrations, um, basically looking at the demand for widgets, so some generic demand curve, and we just take the distribution of world income to generate our demand curve. And it turns out that. Um, it resembles what we're going to come up with as our worst case scenario. Um, so, um, you know, it, these are this is the worst case. Uh, so it's, it doesn't necessarily have to transpire, but it's going to suggest that if the um, income distribution gives us our demand curves, um, that could present worries for um, innovation incentives. Um, so basically, um, we're going to get into to some uh, math later on, but I think we can do the, a lot of the basic ideas in two simple diagrams. Um, so let's start with this diagram here. It's just a, a linear demand curve with intercepts one. Um, and think about we, it's costless production. And you have a monopolist that's selling at a uniform price, linear price on this market. What's going to be the equilibrium? Well, um, they're going to choose a price of a half. They're going to sell a half. And they're going to make um, their profits of a quarter. Um, what's going to be the static distortion there, the pricing distortion? Um, the consumers with valuations less than half that aren't going to get sold to, and so that's going to lead to this Harburger Triangle C. So that's um, one possible uh, distortion there. Is that the worst possible distortion? Well, actually, we can generate a bigger distortion at the extensive margin. And if you'll allow me to give me a free parameter, which is a, a fixed entry cost, K, 
and let me choose any value that I want. You can see how I'm going to do it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, take that k and set it equal to the area of this uh, rectangle plus a little bit, plus epsilon. All right, so, so then what's going to happen is, uh, of course, that's high enough so that it drives the firm out of the market. Or it's not going to have the incentive to enter. It's um, not going to be able to recover its k. Uh, but a social planner um, would, from efficient pricing, uh, get the surplus equal to a, b, and c, and then they have to pay that fixed cost that gets subtracted off, which is about equal to the area of that. So the foregone surplus is equal to the residual area, a plus c. Right, so the, the deadweight loss at the extensive margin can be a, bigger than C. Um, it can include both the uh, consumer surplus and the uh, Harburger triangle as well. Um, so that shows that you know, the distortion at the extensive margin can be bigger, and it can be as big as A plus C. And that's true not just for linear demand, for any, any demand curve. <coughs> OK, so that's true for a given market. What about a class of markets that look like that market? Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is say, what about the class of demand curves um, that say we'll keep the, the same intercepts and we'll keep the same mean value? Um, what, you know, how, what, what could make this kind of market look worse for the, for the firm? Well, it turns out that uh, although the linear demand curve, you know, the, the monopolists can't extract a lot of surplus, still, you know, there's this nice rectangle that they can inscribe under that demand curve. Suppose that we took some of the mass of consumer uh, values from this corner here, and we started to distribute it elsewhere um, to, to other consumer values. You can see that um, that's going to reduce this point, and the limit of that is going to be something that looks like this rectangular hyperbola. And if you do the right truncations at the, at the two sides, um, this turns out to be the, the worst case among that class of demand curves. And it produces a um, monopoly profit equal to the area of that darker shaded rectangle. And since it has the same area underneath it by construction as the linear demand curve, um, the, area of the, the, the area of the potential distortion, this unextracted uh, social surplus, is potential deadweight loss. Um, so this demand curve, and we call it the uh, symmetrically truncated zip demand curve, um, or STARS demand curve, or, but you could call it equal revenue or um, isoelastic. Um, it just it has a property that, in a sense, there's no good point at which the monopolist can price. Um, so it's, it's kind of the least lucrative demand curve possible, and it leads to the greatest worst case bounds on uh, distortion. Um, so that's th those are some of the basic ideas uh, of the paper. Um, what literature uh, does this touch on? Well, one, I have to explain one thing. Um, we have this is actually a spinoff paper. It's kind of of this uh, other paper. I was actually was supposed to present this um, other paper, but unfortunately it got published. So then we had to present this, this spin-off paper. But th there's this other paper about uh, vaccines uh, versus drugs. Um, and it, it, one of the points there is that, um, that th these uh, zip distributions of disease risk, you know, the idea that um, if you have, say, consumers with a, a, of a vaccine with a certain disease risk, um, you know, say a 10% chance of contracting the disease, um, that if suppose you think about consumers with double that disease or 20% chance, a ZIF distribution has, um, when, when you double the disease risk, there are uh, half the number of people with that disease risk or higher. Um, and that turns out to, that's sort of the worst case scenario for trying to extract rent for, uh, for a vaccine manufacturer. Given that the risk resolves by time a drug is sold, so you, uh, if disease risk is the only source of heterogeneity, when you sell a drug, you're actually selling to homogeneous consumers, and you can extract the first best social surplus. Um, there's, that's going to lead to the greatest possible bias against vaccines. Um, and then we, we just said, well, this, all the stuff we're doing for the vaccine markets, that's actually true for widgets markets. So we, this, this paper kind of works out those general implications. Actually, having done that, then the question is, well, you know, why don't you withdraw the vaccines paper? Because if, if you can prove it in general. But I think that what's cool about vaccines versus uh, drugs is it's kind of a, a nice natural experiment where you can actually vary the shape of the demand curve. They're both targeting the same disease. So they're, in a sense, the mean consumer value uh, of curing the, uh, the harm from the disease is going to be the same. But it's, it's a way to keep the kind of mean value the same but vary the shape of the demand curve, depending on when the product is sold and the life cycle of the disease. Um, but there's a, a bunch of papers that use this uh, construction of these equal revenue, these stars demands to uh, find results. Um, 
think about rent extraction and efficiency, there's some general equilibrium papers that um, build on that point. Um, a bunch of papers that talk about the uh, shape of demand curves and in, in, uh, different uh, monopolist or uh, oligopolist policies and uh, how lucrative uh, the markets are. And uh, also we're, we're thinking about um, you know, incentives to enter markets. Um, and so it's related to uh, papers on innovation incentives. All right, so here's the, the model, uh, very simple. So on the consumer side, we just have this uh, demand cur curve Q of P that allows for, uh, could be continuous, but it allows for discrete or, or mixed distributions, an inverse demand curve. We have a choke price, which is just you know, the uh, vertical demand intercept. Um, we're we're going to actually scale things by introducing, you know, if it's possible there's a maximum conceivable valuation for a product. Um, if that's true, um, then we can just scale things by that and we don't have to even inquire into, we, we, we can kind of be free as to what the choke price is of the particular demand curve we're looking at. That's not really that important. On the producer side, we're going to start with the monopoly case. We're going to assume a unit production cost of C. Um, in order to enter, there's a fixed R&D cost K and the entry decision is going to be given by this indicator E. Um, so we're going to have X post and X ante measures of surplus. X, uh, basically the difference is whether you include the fixed cost or not. So we have consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total surplus is the sum. And then we have profit, which just subtracts off K from uh, producer surplus and welfare subtracts off K from total surplus. Um, now we're getting to the, somebody asked about the asterisks, uh, the row star. Uh, so one asterisk is just the equilibrium value and two is the socially optimal value. Um, there are two different concepts of deadweight loss we're going to be thinking about. Static is just, as I said, the Harberger triangle. So it's just uh, first best total ex post surplus minus whatever uh, the surplus com that comes from equilibrium. Um, dynamic um, will indicate by just deadweight loss star is just uh, includes the first best entry decision. So if there's no entry uh, in equilibrium and there is entry um, in the first best, then you're, this is just going to be uh, zero and you're going to get, um, that's going to be deadweight loss is just uh, equal to um, first best surplus. Okay. So um, first of a couple of results that, um, you know, we're going to get to this row star, but this, why is this row star interesting? Um, so theorem one, in, in a monopoly market, the total surplus that cannot be extracted by a firm um, so that's going to be first best surplus minus what the firm extracts. That's going to be a bound on the level of deadweight loss and it's going to be a tight upper bound. Um, and let me just go through uh, the argument. So here we're allowing uh, this K to be this free parameter that we can pick to make the worst case happen. Um, so what we can do is think about arraying values of K from zero up to infinity and it gives us three different um, a partition of three cases. Um, so if, of course if K is, is super high, there's not going to be any deadweight loss. Why? Because the social planner wouldn't want to have this product made, nor does the firm make it. So uh, there's just no surplus in either situation. Um, what if K is really, really low? Well then you get entry by both, um, you know, the social planner would order entry and the firm, the monopolist wants to enter too. So the only source of uh, dynamic, uh, the total source of deadweight loss is just this Harberger triangle. Um, what about in the middle for uh, a medium value of K, it's going to be in between um, the, uh, in this intermediate case where the uh, social planner would want to enter but the firm doesn't. And so uh, deadweight loss is just going to be able, equal to the total surplus um, in the for first best minus the um, entry cost K. And to maximize that you're just going to choose the lowest value of K uh, possible which gives you a value of K of, just, of PS plus uh, epsilon. Um, so that's just the unextracted surplus um, and that's the highest possible deadweight loss um, in, in that market. So in a sense, I mean obviously that's not a very hard thing to, to, to prove. It's, the math is not very hard. So I guess the interesting um, thing here is just that, um, you know, we're interested in this row. We thought it was neat and this is kind of, um, you know, the implication, this is a, a, a supremum that makes it interesting, I suppose. So it's just thinking about um, taking the supremum over possible values of this um, entry cost. Uh, theorem 2 is not really much of a theorem. It just says you get the row by taking this result and just dividing and making it a, a ratio. 
Um, so again, the, but the surplus extraction ratio of this rho star is just um, uh, equilibrium producer surplus, what the monopolist can extract from the market, again, divided by first best uh, surplus. Okay, so that relates rho to uh, deadweight loss. Now, why do you care about uh, or, or this upper bound on deadweight loss? Why do you care about this upper bound on deadweight loss? Um, you know, a couple reasons. Uh, here are two. The social loss from banning price discrimination is uh, tightly bounded above by this uh, deadweight loss. Um, so if you're considering a policy of banning price discrimination, um, this tells you how costly that can be. Uh, and we're talking about subsidy policies. The social gain from subsidy policies um, is, is bounded above by uh, deadweight loss star two. So what does it have to do with uh, general models of imperfect competition? And we get this somewhat weak theorem, which says that uh, consider uh, any model of competition uh, satisfying these pretty weak assumptions. Uh, the upper bound and uh, relative deadweight loss that we got from the monopoly case, um, we can actually even get kind of a, it's, it's sort of the best worst case. We can even get worse cases um, if we add uh, an oligopoly structure. Um, and I suppose it's not hard to see, um, just in the case, you know, think about um, a firm that invents something, enters, and then another firm chases them in and steals their IP and then invents, of course, the first firm then has no incentive to invent then essentially the whole market. Nothing gets invented ever. And so, you know, you get uh, infinite uh, uh, deadweight loss there. Um, the, the, the point is that if you add uh, other firms that are potential entrants, it just adds more free parameters that you can use to uh, even engineer a higher deadweight loss if you want. Um, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty weak theorem because uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so we can say something about general oligopoly models. Um, so that's kind of uh, why we, we should care about this rho star. So now let's go ahead and, and think about the geometry of this rho star for a little while. Okay, so to, to do that, we're going to do um, this exercise of just rescaling things. So we're going to, here, here's this arbitrary demand curve. And what we're going to do is, is rescale and take it and turn it into this one here. So we've kind of shoved it down. We're looking at the net values over cost. And that kind of shifts it down to the uh, horizontal axis. And we're going to scale it also so that now we're thinking about um, consumer values in excess. These are net values over cost of production. Um, and we're going to think about that as a fraction of the maximum, in this case, the maximum conceivable value of any consumer, if that exists. If it, if it doesn't, if the, then we'll just think about this as being the uh, the choke price here. Um, you can rescale it either way. So the rescaled demand will just uh, denote by this phi function. And that's, so you can take any demand curve and just rescale it and make it look like that. So we're going to do everything in terms of this rescaled demand curve. Um, so the rho star equals uh, the ratio of the area under this rescaled demand curve, uh, sorry, the uh, area of the largest inscribed rectangle divided by the area under the curve itself. You can show. Um, and the area under the curve itself is also equal to um, the mean rescaled value. All right, so everything we're going to do is in terms of that rescaled demand curve. Um, so we're going to have a decomposition, and it's going to involve, we already saw this before, this, um, this special case, this star's demand, which is the worst case. Um, and so we're going to say, um, you know, how much surplus can the monopolist extract? We're going to say, how close is this demand curve to this worst case demand curve? Um, and so here's the equation for um, that curve that we drew. It's just basically a constant over x. It's just, uh, you know, some constant times x to the minus 1 power. Um, and then you just have to, this constant has to be uh, computed so that um, this arbitrary demand curve has the same area underneath it that this one does. Um, and the other thing is you just have to make sure th there are these strange truncations just to make sure that it has the, the same intercept so it's a, an admissible rescaled demand. Um, so we call it this, uh, you know, this fancy term symmetrically truncated zip distribution, but um, that's because we're kind of, our intuition comes from thinking about consumer values, but if you're thinking about shapes of demand curves, you could say, well, this is just a, you know, constant uh, revenue uh, demand curve, uh, isoelastic demand curve uh, with an elasticity of one, unit elastic demand curve. Uh, so proposition, this uh, star's demand curve is a unique minimizer of producer surplus among rescaled demands. 
with uh, mean mu. Um, so that's the one we started with. And again, it's the same idea of you take this bulge in the demand curve and you take the consumers there and you redistribute them, the limit of that process is, is this one here. Um, so a little bit about this, this demand curve. Here's uh, what it looks like with a um, mu of 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. You can see that the uh, area is uh, shrinking as mu goes down uh, by definition, but the ratio of the inscribed rectangle to the area under the curve is getting worse and worse and worse as it kind of starts to hug the, um, the axis. And in fact, um, you could just draw this uh, here where if we start with a mu of 1, the, the lowest possible uh, row star is 1. If the, the mean to peak uh, rescaled value is 1, that must mean that consumers, of course, are homogeneous. Everyone's got the same value as the, the maximum. So you can't, there's, uh, the monopolist is going to be able to extract all the surplus. And so there's going to be no dis, uh, potential distortion. But as um, mu gets smaller and smaller, this uh, row lower bar, which is um, the row associated with this worst case demand curve, goes down, um, down to zero. Um, so that lets you do a, a decomposition. What we're going to do is define this zip similarity, which is just how close does your given demand curve look like this worst case. Um, and so we're just going to define that as the ratio of the unextracted surplus divided by the unextracted surplus in the worst case. And that gives you a measure that ranges from 0 to 1. And so, of course, then you can see that you can just rearrange this to get a de this decomposition here. Um, and so what does this formula say? It says that the worst potential for deadweight loss arises when? Um, it arises when um, this is really big, so you have a really zip similar uh, demand curve, um, and also low mean to peak or low mean rescaled values, um, because that's going to lead uh, this term uh, to be, uh, that's going to lead mu to be low. And since rho lower bar of mu is, this is a monotonic function, that's going to lead that to be low as well. Um, so we have some results on static inefficiency. Um, I'll just go through quickly. So it turns out that a market with this, this uh, star's rescaled demand, there exists a monopoly equilibrium in this market in which static deadweight loss is a proportion of total surplus. So this is the Harberger triangle as a portion of total surplus um, actually equals uh, this 1 minus rho lower bar. So essentially what this is saying is that for that special case, there exists an equilibrium where the static and the dynamic deadweight loss are equal. Um, but that's actually, uh, if you look at this result, that's uh, not true for any other market. Any other market, um, the static deadweight loss is a, a portion of, of total surplus is bounded above by that times the zip similarity. Um, so as you get less and less zip similar, there can't be that much um, static deadweight loss. Okay, so again, it implies that the static distortion can approach the dynamic distortion, but only in one equilibrium and only in this one special case. Otherwise, it's going to be dominated by the deadweight loss at the extensive margin. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. I mean, there's a, a bunch of sections in the paper that go through now and say, okay, let's think about special cases that might be useful for pedagogical purposes or that you might see empirically. Um, one useful one is to think about discrete uh, types. So this is a case of, of two types. Um, what's the worst case for two types? It turns out it's um, a row of a, a half. So half the market potentially could be lost to deadweight loss here. And maybe you can kind of even see it, um, from this construction, this is kind of a the zip version of a two-type case. Um, Go back to, the, to what you just said before in the previous slide. Sure. So you're, you're saying that there's, there's literally no other demand curve where the static equals the dynamic? No. Um, what it's saying is that these are, um, well, these are, these, are, um, these are bounds. These are worst case scenarios, first of all. But it, that is true for the, um, that's, that's, I guess that's what this is saying. Because um, static deadweight loss as a function of uh, total surplus is bounded by this. Uh, so with two types, you can generate actually deadweight loss of 50% uh, of the market. With three types, actually the, the worst case scenario is a, a you know, row star of one third. So two thirds of the market could be lost to deadweight loss and, and so forth. Um, the beta distribution is kind of nice because, uh, you know, here these rescaled demand curves are, you know, 
um, between zero and one. So beta is a nice flexible uh, form. And if you, you, you can see that you get this result for in the unimodal case that I rescaled this. I'm not using the A and B parameters, but I'm using uh, mean and variance. Um, that it, when the variance goes up for the unimodal case, the, it's, it's bad for the monopolist, right? The monopolist, in a sense, likes a more homogeneous, lower variance case. The higher the variance, the more heterogeneity. But it's actually not true in the non-unimodal case. You get kind of anything going on. Um, you can uh, leverage some results from statistics on mean, median, and mode, just using the simple idea that the monopolist is always free uh, to, to price at the median. And so that gives you some, um, so that, that gives you a policy that can always do better than that. That gives you this bound here, wh which looks at the ratio of the median to the, the mean. And then you can actually use some results in this mean, median, um, mode inequality to, uh, uh, you, you can leverage some of these to actually, and, and use this inequality to, to get some mileage there. But let's not go into the details there. Um, and we can also have results on general demand curvature using some results from um, Anderson and Renault. So, uh, you know, once you get the early machinery, then you can use a lot of these existing results to say a lot. All right, so uh, I have very little time left. So uh, here's the empirical part. Um, this is the disturbing part. Um, so here we are, the world, uh, we're going to calibrate uh, a demand curve based on the world income distribution. Uh, so here we're taking uh, data from uh, Pinkowski and Sally Martin. Um, and uh, so, so we have uh, income distributions by decade, uh, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2006. And you can see that uh, the distribution has really evolved a lot. Um, uh, there's, uh, in a sense, there's a lot more equality um, there. This is a log scale here. Anyway, so uh, what this picture shows is it, we just took one of the years, let's say 2006, and said, let's just suppose that the willingness to pay is uh, proportional to income. What kind of a demand curve would you get? Uh, that turns out to be this black curve there. Um, it's it's uh, deliberately hard to see. This gray curve there is the worst case zip uh, overlay there. And uh, I've deliberately drawn it so that it's, it's very hard to see the difference there. Um, they're both uh, smushed against the axes. Um, and so it turns out that uh, the, the demand curve arising from that process is, is highly zip similar. Um, if we look over in this case, it's, uh, the ratio is 0.883. And so that means that, for example, that leads to a value of uh, one of rho of 0.29, so one minus rho is 0.71. So the pot maximum of potential dead weight loss could be as high as, uh, you know, three quarters of the of the market. Um, interestingly, although the distribution changes over time, if you look at the uh, potential distortion um, for each one of these years, there's not much change there. Um, it's it's hovering there around you know 70 percent of the market. Okay, so that's uh, all I have time. Uh, appreciate the invitation. I get over to Severin. And I'm not going to review the paper since I see we're in time quite seriously. Um, but uh, this does a not very nice and intuitive characterization of static versus dynamic deadweight loss, um, and says when a monopolist sets profit maximizing price, we have to think about both what share of potential market surplus it captures, and um, how much deadweight loss does that create uh, in order to think about the dynamics. Uh, one thing that made me uncomfortable, and maybe this shows why I'm not at Chicago, is that the optimum here is that the uh, firm price discriminates perfectly and captures all the rents. Um, that at least pricks my ears up a bit and makes me think, wait, is that really where we want to go? Are there other things that could go wrong in a world like that? And I will say I think that there actually are. Um, and, but it does a careful assessment of extraction ratios under various demand functions, which I'm not going to revisit, as Chris talked about. But I want to raise this issue of thinking about extraction ratios at uh, the profit maximizing price because I think there's actually more to it than that that I would argue that you guys might want to think about in pushing this forward because at that optimum uh, we know that profits are uh, 
Changes in profits are second order to, with price changes around that, but changes in dead weight loss are first order with price changes. And in fact, there's an example in the paper that gives the isoelastic case, which is indeterminate. And if you have just a tiny push, like managers like to manage big firms, then you get the, per the perfectly efficient outcome. Um, and there are lots of factors that play. And um, I have ground my teeth through many papers in the last 20 years in I.O. that uh, sort of take these first order conditions as God's truth when I think actually there's lots of other things that are going on in firms. Some are rational factors like dynamics, which now are getting popular in I.O., but for many years were completely ignored. Um, in a multi-period market lock-in, uh, customer learning, customer investment in the product, uh, the response of competitors in a dynamic sense, not just a simple price game. Um, and then less mainstream factors like empire building, uh, loss aversion. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot because when you're in the Bay Area, you hear the term constantly, which is customer acquisition, uh, which is a really cool term in Silicon Valley, but actually I think has some important economic meaning. Part of it is just the information of a mailing list turns out to be incredibly valuable in today's world in lots of retail sectors. And parts of it is stickiness, and stickiness in ways that uh, I think that we haven't really fully explored. And the underlying issue here is what's the second order change here? That is, when we, it, it, we can figure out what the optimum price is, but how much are you really losing being far, far away from the optimum? And I think that would be an interesting thing to explore, and I think it naturally follows from what you've done already. Um, then there's the question that when you teach MBAs, they always ask you, wait, how do you know what demand is? And you mumble something, or you say, wait till your marketing class, um, uh, or something of that sort. And the fact is, demand's going to be estimated with noise, actually with a lot of noise. And a big, an important factor that managers are going to think about is what's the cost of getting it wrong, given that I don't know exactly what demand is. And they're going to think both about the cost of getting it wrong in the firm level sense and in the personal level career sense. And both of those are going to have big effects. And my intuition is, and I don't, I'm not sure somebody's explored this, is that there is option value to being large. That is, firms like to be large, partially this customer acquisition concept that if you think of something else you might want to do, you got this customer base to do it with. This is clearly going on in Silicon Valley right now, that firms start firms just to get a bunch of customers and later try to figure out what you're going to actually do with them because you're not making any money off of whatever it is they're buying you from you right now. So I think that these sort of factors are also playing a role, and they really are going to, to affect this thinking about what are the incentives, what's the extraction, if the, second, if, the, uh, if the second order term in the profit function basically isn't, if the profit function isn't too steep around the optimum. Um, so we should, could you, th you could think about how should firms price optimally and incorporate new evidence as new evidence of the market uh, of demand comes about. And an interesting test that I think would be think worth thinking about is to try to take some of these calculations you've done about zip similarity and say, do firm pricing actually look like that? If there's some way to characterize zip similarity and to then say, well, that should imply something about the prices firms are charging, is the way actually to do a test. My guess is this um, second order term is really going to matter. There are going to be a lot of firms that are way beyond uh, profit maximizing output by that calculation. And it has something to do with wanting to be big, maybe not just for career reasons, maybe for perfectly rational, dynamic, long-run reasons. Um, Chris was pretty careful about uh, saying that there's this entry cost in the paper. It refers to it as R&D. There's nothing R&D-ish about it. It, it really, other than it's just an entry cost. It's sunk, um, and it's independent of scale. Um, and then it requires some surplus. Um, of, extraction. There is a point um, uh, that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but I think that the paper doesn't explore that it'd be worth thinking about, about this, there's actually some symmetry on, this, on the consumer side. Consumers make entry investments and have to think that they're going to earn them back.
The one place I remember saying this once is in a real estate market, the idea of how real estate agents actually extract surpluses. You actually have to make some big investment to go look at a house, and then they know there's a certain level. Of, but there's a lot of that sort of story running around in, sh in sales, showing up for sales, and so forth. Um, and I think it would be worth thinking about that. It's, it's different for various reasons, but um, I think that there's further direction to push it. Uh, you can't think about this paper without, I don't remember the name of the drug firm that just bought the drug and, uh, and increased the price by 50 times, um, moving right up that demand curve um, and uh, not having that well received. <laughs> uh, pardon? No, it's not just theory, but it's also not holding. They've now rolled the price <laughs> increase back. Um, and I think it does raise these issues of um, equity norms playing a role. Or just generally this idea of non-economic anger, anger responses to pure scarcity. Forget about market power. Um, and I think that that's, um, the equity norms play a role. It relates to a question that I have wondered about for years, um, which I have started two projects on, that it, which is why firms bother justifying price increases. I, you never see firms say, we're raising price so we can make more money. Um, they say, our costs have gone up, it's not us. We're and I think there's some interesting, both sort of the larger equity norms around that about, but also some real straight price theory eco micro stories, one of which is, we're not holding you up. You're a consumer, we're not the sort of firm that's going to rip you off once you've made an investment in our product. So if you're the sort of person who thought we were good to you, we are good to you, it's just that our costs have gone up. Another story that I think is uh, equally likely is uh, don't look over there at those other firms because everybody's costs have gone up. So when we raise our price, we're going to signal there's no point in searching be it by saying, look, it's a general price increase. And I think that these sorts of equity norms play a role in what firms think they can do in terms of price changes, and more generally, their distribution consequences. Um, so then I will end on the complete cheap shot, which is second best considerations. So I used to be an I.O. economist. I now do mostly energy, which is a wonderful area to work in because price theory just has all this great bite. I, t I tell my young colleagues, you know, you guys work in differentiated product markets. I've done economics for a long time. I still don't believe any models of differentiated product. But, you know, you work on a commodity. This is where economics really works. Um, and I thought that pretty seriously until I started hanging out with environmental economists. And I still think it for sort of the more modest uh, claims that uh, Glenn made early on about what we're getting from price theory. But when you move into welfare, you start, at least I start got getting wobbly knees. So I made the statement, well, of course we should price uh, pollution because that's a missing market and so forth. And yeah, even if we don't recycle the revenue, um, we're going to be, you know, we're moving in the right direction. And then my public finance colleagues, and when Alan Auerbach tells me I'm wrong, I listen, said, no, that's actually not right. See, there are these pre-existing distortions in the market, and one of them, of course, is that we tax labor a lot, and if all you do is tax the, raise the price of polluting and give it back in lump sum and don't re re reduce the other distortion, you're actually making the other distortion even worse because you're raising the price of labor even more. And you could actually reduce total welfare in the economy. And actually, some people have done these calculations. Larry Goulder at Stanford has thought about this a lot. I.O. completely takes a pass on this. Um, I can't think of an I.O. paper, although somebody will surely now point one out, that has done micro price theory analysis and then said, let's at least consider the larger context of this and whether breaking up that beer cartel is really such a good idea. Um, and the answer is breaking up the beer cartel probably may or may not be such a good idea. In fact, merger to monopoly in beer, now I'm not going to raise wine because I know there are a bunch of wine snobs um, in economics. There's a journal of wine economics. 
Um, but in beer, we all know, has big negative externalities. And if we raise, <laughs> Eddie's a beer snob, apparently. Um, beer has negative externalities, and maybe it wouldn't be so, okay, cigarettes. Um, uh, although, I, I gave a seminar at Chicago in the 80s, and I know at that time that wouldn't have gone over well. But, um, but there are products, and this is, the, this is one form of the sort of larger considerations of the pre other distortions in the economy. Um, so in the spirit of price theory is great, but there's more we can do, um, I just wanted to raise that idea. We won't be able to track down every distortion. Uh, that's not, I think, what we need to do. But I think thinking carefully about, well, how does this fit into the larger distortions, which the environmental economists and the public finance economists really are much better at holding their feet to the fire on this and saying, um, well, okay, but how does this fit into the full economy? Uh, I think in I.O. we would uh, be well served to at least start thinking in that direction. Thank you. So you mentioned earlier, uh, Chris, in your discussion about entry into markets, and I'm thinking of this in terms of international trade. And if I thought of K as not being a, a cost of, of entry in a, in a real sense, but rather just a tariff, that's not something that the social planner would want to take, a, take out as a real cost, right? I mean, you'd think of that tariff as being distortionary in and of itself. And so then the question would be, um, you know, first of all, is that, to me, that seems like the biggest distortion because you've got these goods that should be traded in other countries where they're just not even available and now you lose that whole you, you lose the whole area under the demand curve and then the, the second point would be then you know this theorem about uh rho being the uh you know the maximum i think it's rho was your in that thing being the maximum you know because you've got that remember the, the the three areas where you have if k is really large you don't want to be there anyway but in this story if K is large, you do want to be there, because that's just, that's just a, a distortion. So just a, a thought on that. Um, so um, just answering Eddie's question. So, so I mean, in a sense, a tariff, it's you know, per unit, that's going to be more like an increase in C rather than K. But if you think about, for example, you know, pay, overcoming language barriers or you know, all those fixed costs of establishing an outpost there, that would be like that. Well, just think of it. That would be the K. Okay. In that, or a non-tariff uh, barrier, which yeah. is not, you're not, not yeah. allowed to produce. So that's, um, yeah. I mean, I think that could be even a better application of the virus, and that's exactly that. that. I mean, that's the distortion, is that you see this country, the, all these other countries being served. Here's this country, this is a product, but yet it's not, you know, it's not being rolled out in that country, and that's the big source of the distortion. Um, but I mean, the reason that we call it R&D, uh, it, it, it's any entry cost, as you say. Um, we actually backed into this paper from the vaccine stuff, so that's why we're thinking about R&D. Um, just a few, uh, should I, let's take more questions or say a few things about Severin? Or go ahead and Kevin? say a few things. We got a few minutes, so go ahead. Okay. Um, so anyway, thanks for the, the comments. Um, I mean, a lot. Of, I think a lot of your focus was you know, you're, you're, you're working on energy, which are markets that actually exist, and you know, there's, so, so you're thinking about, in a sense, it's always our intuition is in those markets, it's a static deadweight loss. Um, and in fact, you make a, a really good point about this, the chaotic nature of that worst case demand curve. If you just think about static deadweight loss, that, um, you know, if you just take a little, the demand curve and you put a little bulge at the top, then essentially the monopolist is going to serve just the highest demand consumers, you're going to get a huge deadweight loss. Um, and if you could just uh, provide a tiny subsidy, then you know that would cause it all to disappear. Just you know, epsilon subsidy, which in a sense doesn't have to include that much of a, a distortion because you know, say there's a social cost of public funds or something. Well, it's only an epsilon uh, tax that you'd need. Um, and just you know, there's a, this whole debate in law and economics on uh, equity versus efficiency. You know, should we just set our laws to be efficient and let you know, let the tax code do the redistribution. Um, uh, but anyway, I appreciate my, my point though was not normative in that sense. It was more positive that I think in practice, this may not be that good a predictor of where firms end up because there are all, because when they're close, when the profit function is pretty flat, um, there's all these other, I, you know, I think profits do matter and guys yeah. try to maximize but, them, but they do try to do a lot of other things. So that's the, the kind of the strange thing here is that um, if you think about the, where the maximum distortion is coming from, it's not you know the static. It's coming from 
uh, you can't even see it because it's all those products that you would have liked to have had in your economy that don't exist, or maybe all those countries that you'd like to have imports. And so, but it, it sort of doesn't matter. The weird thing about this demand curve is, like, the monopolist can miss you know, and, and misestimate by a lot, and the profits are gonna be the same no, no matter what, but it's just that there's so little surplus to be extracted relative to the social surplus that no matter what pricing decision they would have set, it's still not an attractive market. Um. I really like this paper. Um, so I had some questions about its implications. Um, if you think about it as an entry cost paper, it must have some implication about the shape of the demand curve inducing high rates of entry. Now, you don't talk about exit, but uh, you know that, that's going to depend on sort of the, the irreversible nature of the, of the product. But th that's one thing, and the question is whether the heterogeneous amount of entry across industries at all, is at all related to sort of the similarity of demand curves. The second thing is what I think is really neat about this paper is you can flip it around. It's not where well, you don't get entry, but let's suppose you get entry. Then let's pose the question, should I take the demand curve, the shape of the demand curve as exogenous? What a marketing, you can think of marketers as trying to apply their skills, their advertising or something, at segments of the market to alter the demand curve in order to allow greater extraction of surplus. And um, um, I've never seen, you know, marketers sort of, or I.O. guys talk about marketing very much at all but that would be sort of targeted marketing. And then the final thing is there is a literature in I.O. about altering the shape of the demand curve. And you alter the shape of the demand curve by altering the bundling of the products or, or, or the characteristics in the product. And I thought that was kind of an interesting implication of your paper that you have an implication of, uh, I'm a monopolist, and now how should I change the various underlying characteristics in order to make the demand curve such that I can extract all the surplus. So I don't know if you thought about those issues. Um, yeah, so I mean, there, I, I said there's this literature that talks a little bit about shapes of demand. So this Johnson and Myatt, that's one of their points is that suppose, you, you know, you could advertise and they, they kind of get this result that you either do all or nothing. You kind of go, just do no advertising or you go to the max. Uh, but th they have this kind of special case where yeah. uh, demand only can, uh, they have a pretty limited. I identify the middle part of the, that demand curve, okay, and then move it up so that it becomes like a right angle. Yeah, so no, I, I, that's a great, I, I think that's yeah. a, a great idea. Um, the other part was block booking, right? Yeah, so block, yes, exactly. So it's this whole thing of block booking where you, you combine things that you know, alter the demand curve in a way that, in fact, that's an example where you get a perfectly uh, yeah. Uh, right angle. Yeah, but indeed. The general point is, I have a product that has multiple characteristics. How do I choose those yeah. characteristics? Yeah. So, so in the vaccines paper, we actually looked at um, across different diseases and different disease risks, and so we we looked at whether uh, ones that were more Ziffian had yeah. um, high rates of entry, and for um, for drugs relative to vaccines. So, what we did see. I mean, it's kind of we didn't have a lot of observations because there's only 60 diseases that were eligible for this, but. Um, you know, so we saw some weak empirical evidence that was in favor of the theory there. But uh, maybe Owen Zadar has uh, the, all the data on the on the firms. We can do a more <laughs> systematic study uh, there. But anyway, th those are good suggestions for uh, future inquiry. Yeah. So as a practical matter, for any really high value product, it seems like there's an opportunity one for the firm to collect data on consumers and figure out valuations, and two, to write and enforce contracts, which basically prevent people who buy it from reselling it. And so you can price discriminate, right? There's some costs of price discriminating, but that seems to be sort of, I would think that's the binding constraint for things which generate a lot of value. And maybe I'm just not thinking of the right markets, uh, so it's, it's, you know, maybe maybe it is vaccines, but the world distribution seems strange to be thinking about. We have different prices in different countries. We have regulations that prevent importing drugs from Canada. So it seems like, at minimum, we should be thinking about the within country and perhaps probably even segmenting the market more. So I'm just trying to understand sort of what I should be thinking about. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, these are, in a sense, bounds and you know, trying to fix our intuition. But, I mean, in a sense, one of the issues was that we sort of related it back to price discrimination and said that, you know, if that's how that's generating the rents, then this is the deadweight loss from uh, prohibiting that um, policy. But most of what Chris is getting is from the within country distribution because it's the Pareto upper tail, which is almost all within countries, not across countries, which is actually generating most of that stuff. So I don't think, I just did a back of the envelope calculation on that and I'm pretty sure most of it's coming from the within country, so. Um, I have to get his data on, he's got better data on world income distributions, so. Um, but I, I, th those are all, those are good points. Um, and you know, certainly we should do more serious calibrations and you know, just look within, say for, for, for pharmaceuticals, if the US is generating all the demand, you know, just look within that, for example. I like Faber, I was interested in the part in the end of the income distribution, but when you get to such extreme distribution of value, don't you have to entertain the idea that the high value guy might be willing to pay to have the thing invented? <laughs> and maybe sell some to make a little cash on the side, but it's a kind of price discrimination, but it's not high tech, it's just, I'm Bill Gates and I want to live longer, so I'm going to pay to live longer. So we have to we have to look at the distribution and see just how you know how much demand is generated if you just sell it to this, the really super rich. Um, but uh, th I didn't think of that. That's actually an interesting way to affect price discrimination. It's related to Neil's point, which I think both of these points are saying that the the, kind, the richness of the contract space might be a function of the surplus on the table, yeah. which which kind of makes sense. If you have con contracting frictions or whatever of fixed size, as you put more surplus on the table you have more of an incentive to work around those frictions. That, that's how I'm, I mean, that's, I, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but that's how I'm reading that, what these guys are saying. Yep. Any other questions or comments? If the demand function becomes too convex, then the second order condition of profit maximization at the interior point will start to fail. And it seems to me that your extreme case is butting up right against that. Is that right? Um, well, you know, you get this, uh, that multiplicity result where, you know, every single uh, price is, uh, they're all yeah. equivalent. Um, Unit elastic, they'll yeah. all be equivalent. But then if you combine that with severance points about uh, exactly that kind of thing, that anyway the uh, first order derivative of the profit function is zero at the point, and there's some uncertainty about demand, then maybe it starts to explain a lot of things that uh, the 5,000% rise in uh, the prices of pharmaceuticals when one company took over another. Maybe the old one thought that the global optimum was at the lower end of the price. The uh, new one thought it was at the upper end of the price. So leave it to you to, I mean, I didn't answer the question about, you know, what would you look for? And one thing would be sort of a chaotic, uh, you know, if, if the, this market actually existed, you should see this chaotic pricing possibly. So um, I'm not sure that's what, it, what went on with that example, but that I appreciate that that's a friendly uh, uh, amendment there. All right, any other questions? All right, well, why don't we, we got in a couple minutes early, so.